Chapter Ten of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Best Russian Short Stories. Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Shades, a fantasy by Vladimir G. Korolenko. Part Two. Four. On a rocky slope sat a man in deep despair. He had thrown a cloak over his head and was bowed to the ground. Another figure approached him softly, cautiously climbing upward and carefully feeling every step. The first man uncovered his face and exclaimed, Is that you I just now saw, my good Socrates? Is that you passing by me in this cheerless place? I have already spent many hours here without knowing when day will relieve the night. I have been waiting in vain for the dawn. Yes, I am Socrates, my friend. And you, are you not Elpidius, who died three days before me? Yes, I am Elpidius, formerly the richest tanner in Athens, now the most miserable of slaves. For the first time I understand the words of the poet, better to be a slave in this world than a ruler in gloomy Hades. My friend, if it is disagreeable for you where you are, why don't you move to another spot? O oh, Socrates, I marvel at you. How dare you wander about in this cheerless gloom? I, I sit here overcome with grief and bemoan the joys of a fleeting life. Friend Elpidius, like you, I too was plunged in this gloom when the light of earthly life was removed from my eyes. But an inner voice told me, Tread this new path without hesitation. And I went. But whither do you go, O son of Sophroniscus? Here there is no way, no path, not even a ray of light. Nothing but a chaos of rocks, mist, and gloom. True, but, my Elpidius, since you are aware of this sad truth, have you not asked yourself what is the most distressing thing in your present situation? Undoubtedly the dismal darkness. Then one should seek for light. Perchance you will find here the great law, that mortals must in darkness seek the source of life. Do you not think it is better so to sink than to remain sitting in one spot? I think it is. Therefore, I keep walking. Farewell. O oh, good Socrates, abandon me not. You go with sure steps through the pathless chaos in Hades. Hold out to me but a fold of your mantle. If you think it is better for you to, then follow me, friend Elpidius. And the two shades walked on, while the soul of Stesippus, released by sleep from its mortal envelope, flew after them, greedily absorbing the tones of the clear Socratic speech. "'Are you here, good Socrates?' the voice of the Athenian again was heard. "'Why are you silent? Converse shortened the way, and I swear by Hercules never did I have to traverse such a horrid way.' What questions, friend Elpidius? The question of one who seeks knowledge brings forth answers and produces conversation. Elpidius maintained silence for a moment, and then, after he had collected his thoughts, asked, Yes, this is what I wanted to say. Tell me, my poor Socrates, did they at least give you a good burial? I must confess, friend Elpidius, I cannot satisfy your curiosity. I understand, my poor Socrates. It doesn't help you cut a figure. Now with me it was so different. Oh, how they buried me. How magnificently they buried me, my poor fellow wanderer. I still think with great pleasure of those lovely moments after my death. First they washed me and sprinkled me with well-smelling balsam. Then my faithful Larissa dressed me in garments of the finest weave. The best mourning women of the city tore their hair from their heads because they had been promised good pay, and in a family vault they placed an amphora, 
a crater with beautiful decorated handles of bronze, and besides a vile, Stay, friend Alpidius, I am convinced that the faithful Larissa converted her love into several minas, yet exactly ten minas and four drachmas, not counting the drinks for the guests. I hardly think that the richest tanner can come before the souls of his ancestors and boast of such respect on the part of the living. Friend Alpidius, don't you think that money would have been of more use to the poor people who are still alive in Athens, and to you at this moment? Admit, Socrates, you are speaking in envy, responded Elpidius, pained. I am sorry for you, unfortunate Socrates, although, between ourselves, you really deserved your fate. I myself in the family circle said more than once that an end ought to be put to your impious doings because... Stay, friend, I thought you wanted to draw a conclusion, and I fear you are straying from the straight path. Tell me, my good friend, whither does your wavering thought tend? I wanted to say that in my goodness I am sorry for you. A month ago... I myself spoke against you in the assembly, but truly none of us who shouted so loud wanted such a great ill to befall you. Believe me, now I am all the sorrier for you, unhappy philosopher. I thank you, but tell me, my friend, do you perceive a brightness before your eyes? No, on the contrary, such darkness lies before me, that I must ask myself whether this is not the misty region of Orcus. This way, therefore, is just as dark for you as for me. Quite right. If I am not mistaken, you are even holding on to the folds of my cloak. Also true. Then we are both in the same position. You see, your ancestors are not hastening to rejoice in the tale of your pompous burial. Where is the difference between us, my good friend? But, Socrates, have the gods enveloped your reason in such obscurity that the difference is not clear to you? Friend, if your situation is clear to you, then give me your hand and lead me, for I swear by the dog... You let me go ahead in this darkness. Cease your scoffing, Socrates. Do not make sport, and do not compare yourself, your godless self, with a man who died in his own bed. Ah, I believe I am beginning to understand you. But tell me, Elpidius, do you hope ever again to rejoice in your bed? Oh, I think not. And was there ever a time when you did not sleep in it? Yes, that was before I bought goods from Agesilaus at half their value. You see, that Agesilaus is really a deep-dyed rogue. Ah, never mind about Agesilaus. Perhaps he is getting them back from your widow at a quarter of their value. Then wasn't I right when I said that you were in possession of your bed only part of the time? Yes, you were right. Well, and I, too, was in possession of the bed in which I died part of the time. Proteus, the good guard of the prison, lent it to me for a period. Oh, if I had known what you were aiming at with your talk, I wouldn't have answered your wily questions. By Hercules, such profanation is unheard of. He compares himself with me. Why, I could put an end to you with two words if it came to it. Say them, Elpidius, without fear. Words can scarcely be more destructive to me than the hemlock. Well, then, that is just what I wanted to say. You unfortunate man, you died by the sentence of the court and had to drink hemlock. But I have known that since the day of my death, even long before. And you, unfortunate Elpidius, tell me what caused your death. Oh, with me it was different, entirely different. You see, I got the dropsy in my abdomen. An expensive physician from Corinth was called, who promised to cure me for two minas, and he was given half that amount in advance. I'm afraid that Larissa, in her lack of experience in such things, gave him the other half too. 
Then the physician did not keep his promise. That's it. And you died from dropsy. Ah, oh, Socrates, believe me, three times it wanted to vanquish me, and finally it quenched the flame of my life. And tell me, did death by dropsy give you great pleasure? Oh, wicked Socrates, don't make sport of me. I told you it wanted to vanquish me three times. I bellow like a steer under the knife of the slaughterer, and beg the passé to cut the thread of my life as quickly as possible. That doesn't surprise me. But from what do you conclude that the dropsy was pleasanter to you than the hemlock to me? The hemlock made an end of me in a moment. I see. I fell into your sneer again, you crafty sinner. I won't enrage the gods still more by speaking with you, you destroyer of sacred customs. Both were silent and quiet reigned. But in a short while, Elpidius was again the first to begin a conversation. Why are you silent, good Socrates? My friend, didn't you yourself ask for silence? I am not proud, and I can treat men who are worse than I am considerately. Don't let us quarrel. I did not quarrel with you, friend Elpidius, and did not wish to say anything to insult you. I am merely accustomed to get at the truth of things by comparisons. My situation is not clear to me. You consider your situation better, and I should be glad to learn why. On the other hand, it would not hurt you to learn the truth, whatever shape it may take. Well, no more of this. Tell me, are you afraid? I don't think that the feeling I have now can be called fear. I am afraid, although I have less cause than you to be at odds with the gods. But don't you think that the gods, in abandoning us to ourselves here in this chaos, have cheated us of our hopes? That depends upon what sort of hopes they were. What did you expect from the gods, Elpidius? Well, well, what did I expect from the gods? What curious questions you ask, Socrates? If a man throughout life brings offerings, and at his death passes away with a pious heart, and all that custom demands, the gods might at least send someone to meet him, at least one of the inferior gods, to show a man the way. But that reminds me, many a time, when I begged for good luck in traffic in hides, I promised Hermes calves. And you didn't have luck? Oh yes, I had luck, good Socrates, but... I understand you had no calf. Bah! Socrates, a rich tenor, and not have calves? Now I understand you had luck, had calves, but you kept them for yourself, and Hermes received nothing. You're a clever man, I've often said so. I kept only three of my ten oaths, and I didn't deal differently with the other gods. If the same is the case with you... Isn't that the reason, possibly, why we are now abandoned by the gods? To be sure, I ordered Larissa to sacrifice a whole hecatomb after my death. But that is Larissa's affair, where it was you, friend Elpidius, who made the promises. That's true, that's true. But you, good Socrates, could you, godless as you are, deal better with the gods than I, who was a god-fearing tanner? My friend... I know not whether I dealt better or worse. At first I brought offerings without having made vows. Later I offered neither calves nor vows. What, not a single calf, you unfortunate man? Yes, friend, if Hermes had had to live by my gifts, I am afraid he would have grown very thin. I understand. You did not traffic in cattle, so you offered articles of some other trade probably a meaner or so of what the pupils paid you. You know, my friend, I didn't ask pay of my pupils, and my trade scarcely sufficed to support me. If the guides reckoned on the sorry remnants of my meals, they miscalculated. Oh, blasphemer! In comparison with you, I can be proud of my piety. Ye gods, look upon this man! I did deceive you at times, but now and then I shared with you the surplus of some fortunate deal. 
He who gives at all gives much in comparison with a blasphemer who gives nothing. Socrates, I think you had better go on alone. I fear that your company, godless one, damages me in the eyes of the gods. As you will, good Elpidius. I swear by the dog no one shall force his company on another. Unhand the fold of my mantle and farewell. I will go on alone. And Socrates walked forward with a sure tread, feeling the ground, however, at every step. But Elpidius behind him instantly cried out, Wait, wait, my good fellow citizen, do not leave an Athenian alone in this horrible place. I was only making fun. Take what I said as a joke, and don't go so quickly. I marvel how you can see a thing in this hellish darkness. Friend, I have accustomed my eyes to it. That's good. Still, oh, I can't approve of your not having brought sacrifices to the gods. No, I can't, poor Socrates, I can't. The Honourable Sophroniscus certainly taught you better in your youth, and you yourself used to take part in the prayers. I saw you. Yes, but I am accustomed to examine all our motives, and to accept only those that after investigation proved to be reasonable. And so a day came on which I said to myself, Socrates, here you are praying to the Olympians. Why are you praying to them? Elpidius laughed. Really, you philosophers sometimes don't know how to answer the simplest questions. I am a plain tanner who never in my life studies sophistry, yet I know why I must honour the Olympians. Tell me quickly, so that I too may know why. Why? <laughs> it's too simple, you wise Socrates. So much the better if it's simple. But don't keep your wisdom from me. Tell me, why must one honour the gods? Why? Because everybody does it. Friend, you know very well that not everyone honours the gods. Wouldn't it be more correct to say many? Very well, many. But tell me, don't more men deal wickedly than righteously? I think so. You find more wicked people than good people. Therefore, if you follow the majority, you ought to deal wickedly and not righteously. What are you saying? I'm not saying it, you are, but I think the reason that men reverence the Olympians is not because the majority worship them. We must find another, more rational ground. Perhaps you mean they deserve reverence? Yes, very right. Good. But then arises a new question. Why do they deserve reverence? Because of their greatness. Ah, that's more like it. Perhaps I will soon be agreeing with you. It only remains for you to tell me wherein their greatness consists. That's a difficult question, isn't it? Let us seek the answer together. Homer says that the impetuous Ares, when stretched flat on the ground by a stone thrown by Pallas Athene, covered with his body the space that could be travelled in seven mornings. You see, what an enormous space. Is that wherein greatness consists? There you have me, my friend. That raises another question. Do you remember the athlete Theophantes? He towered over the people a whole head's length, whereas Pericles was no larger than you. But whom do we call great, Pericles or Theophantes? I see that greatness does not consist in size of body, in that you're right. I am glad we agree. Perhaps greatness consists in virtue. Certainly. I think so too. Well then, we must bow to him, the small before the large, or those who are large in virtues before the wicked. The answer is clear. I think so too. Now, we will look further into this matter. Tell me truly, did you ever kill other people's children with arrows? It goes without saying, never. Do you think so ill of me? Nor have you, I trust, ever seduced the wives of other men? I was an upright tanner and a good husband. Don't forget that, Socrates, I beg of you. You never became a brute, 
nor by your lustfulness gave your faithful Larissa occasion to revenge herself on women whom you had ruined, and on their innocent children? You anger me really, Socrates. But perhaps you snatch your inheritance from your father and throw him into prison. Never! Why are these insulting questions? Wait, my friend. Perhaps you will both reach a conclusion. Tell me, what would you have considered a man great who had done all of these things of which I have spoken? No, no, no. I should have called such a man a scoundrel and lodged public complaint against him with the judges in the marketplace. Well, Elpidius, why did you not complain in the marketplace against Zeus and the Olympians? The son of Cronos carried on war with his own father and was seized with brutal lust for the daughters of men, while Hera took vengeance upon innocent virgins. Did not both of them convert the unhappy daughter of Inachus into a common cow? Did not Apollo kill all the children of Niobe with his arrows? Did not Calenius steal bulls? Well then, Elpidius, if it is true that he who has less virtue must do honour to him who has more, then you should not build altars to the Olympians, but they to you. Blaspheme not, impious Socrates. Keep quiet. How dare you judge the acts of the gods? Friend, higher powers judge them. Let us investigate the question. What is the mark of divinity? I think you said greatness which consists in virtue. Now is not this greatness the one divine spark in man? But if we test the greatness of the gods by our small human virtues, and it turns out that which measures is greater than that which is measured, then it follows that the divine principle itself condemns the Olympians. But then, what then? Then, friend Alpidius, they are no gods but deceptive phantoms, creations of a dream. Is it not so? Ah, that's where your talk leads, you barefooted philosopher. Now I see what they said of you is true. You are like that fish that takes men captive with its look. So you took me captive in order to confound my believing soul and awaken doubt in it. It was already beginning to waver in its reverence for Zeus. Speak alone. I won't answer any more. Be not wrathful, Elpidius. I don't wish to inflict any evil upon you. But if you are tired of following my arguments to their logical conclusions... Permit me to relate to you an allegory of a Malaysian youth. Allegories rest the mind, and the relaxation is not unprofitable. Speak, if your story is not too long, and its purpose is good. Its purpose is truth, friend Alpidius, and I will be brief. Once, you know, in ancient times, Miletus was exposed to the attacks of the barbarians. Among the youth who were seized was a son of the wisest and best of all the citizens in the land. His precious child was overtaken by a severe illness and became unconscious. He was abandoned and allowed to lie like worthless booty. In the dead of night he came to his senses. High above him glimmered the stars. Round about stretched the desert. And in the distance he heard the howl of beasts of prey. He was alone. He was entirely alone, and, besides that, the gods had taken from him the recollection of his former life. In vain he racked his brain. It was as dark and empty as the inhospitable desert in which he found himself. But somewhere, far away, behind the misty and obscure figures conjured up by his reason, loomed the thought of his lost home and a vague realization of the figure of the best of all men. And in his heart resounded the word, Father. Doesn't it seem to you that the fate of this youth resembles the fate of all humanity? How so? Do we not all awake to life on earth with a hazy recollection of another home? And does not the figure of the great unknown hover before our souls? Continue, Socrates. I am listening. The youth revived, arose, and walked cautiously, seeking to avoid all dangers. When, after long wanderings, his strength was nearly gone, he discerned a fire in the misty distance, which illumined the darkness and banished the cold. A faint hope crept into his weary soul, 
and the recollections of his father's house again awoke within him. The youth walked toward the light and cried, It is you, my father, it is you. And was it his father's house? No, it was merely a night lodging of wild nomads. So, for many years, he led the miserable life of a captive slave, and only in his dream saw the distant home and rested on his father's bosom. Sometimes, with weak hand, he endeavoured to lure from dead clay or wood or stone the face and form that ever hovered before him. There even came moments where he grew weary and embraced his own handiwork and prayed to it and wet it with his tears. But the stone remained cold stone, and as he waxed in years, the youth destroyed his creations, which already seemed to him a vile defamation of his ever-present dreams. At last fate brought him to a good barbarian, who asked him for the cause of his constant mourning. When the youth confided to him the hopes and longings of his soul, the barbarian, a wise man, said, the world would be better did such a man and such a country exist as that of which you speak. But by what mark would you recognize your father? In my country, answered the youth, they reverence wisdom and virtue, and looked up to my father as to the master. Well and good, answered the barbarian. I must assume that a kernel of your father's teaching resides in you. Therefore, take up the wondrous staff and proceed on your way. Seek perfect wisdom and truth, and when you have found them, cast aside your staff. There will be your home and your father. And the youth went on his way at break of day. Did he find the one whom he sought? He is still seeking. Many countries, cities, and men has he seen. He has come to know all the ways by land. He has traversed the stormy seas. He has searched the courses of the stars in heaven by which pilgrim can direct his course over the limitless deserts. And each time that on his wearisome way an inviting fire lighted up the darkness before his eyes, his heart beat faster and hope crept into his soul. That is my father's hospitable house, he thought. And when the hospitable host would greet the tired traveller, and offer him the peace and blessing of his hearth, the youth would fall at his feet and say with emotion, I thank you, my father. Do you not recognize your son? And many were prepared to take him as their son, for at that time children were frequently kidnapped. But after the first glow of enthusiasm, the youth would detect traces of imperfection, sometimes even of wickedness. Then he would begin to investigate and to test his host with questions concerning justice and injustice, and soon he would be driven forth again upon the cold, wearisome way. More than once he said to himself, I will remain at this last hearth, I will preserve my last belief, it shall be the home of my father. Do you know, Socrates, perhaps that would have been the most sensible thing to do? So he thought sometimes, but the habit of investigating, the confused dream of a father, gave him no peace. Again and again he shook the dust from his feet. Again and again he grasped his staff. Not a few stormy nights found him shelterless. Doesn't it seem to you that the fate of this youth resembles the fate of mankind? Why? Does not the race of men make trial of its childish belief, and doubt it while seeking the unknown? Doesn't it fashion the form of its father in wood, stone, custom, and tradition? And then man finds the form imperfect, destroys it, and again goes on his wanderings in the desert of doubt always for the purpose of seeking something better. Oh, you cunning sage, now I understand the purpose of your allegory, and I will tell you to your face that if only a ray of light were to penetrate this gloom, I would not put the Lord on trial with unnecessary questions. Friend, the light is already shining, answered Socrates. 5. It seemed as if the words of the philosopher had taken effect. High up in the distance a beam of light penetrated a vapoury envelope, 
and disappeared in the mountains. It was followed by a second and a third. There, beyond the darkness, luminous genie seemed to be hovering, and a great mystery seemed about to be revealed, as if the breath of life were blowing, as if some great ceremony were in process. But it was still very remote. The shades descended thicker and thicker. Foggy clouds rolled into masses, separated, and chased one another endlessly, ceaselessly. A blue light from a distant peak fell upon a deep ravine. The clouds rose and covered the heavens to the zenith. The rays disappeared and withdrew to a greater and greater distance, as if fleeing from this veil of shades and horrors. Socrates stood and looked after them sadly. Elpidius peered up at the peak full of dread. Look, Socrates, what do you see there on the mountain? Friend, answered the philosopher, let us investigate our situation. Since we are in motion, we must arrive somewhere, and since earthly existence must have a limit, I believe that this limit is to be found at the parting of two beginnings. In the struggle of light with darkness, we attain the crown of our endeavours. Since the ability to think has not been taken from us, I believe that it is the will of the divine being who called our power of thinking into existence that we should investigate the goal of our endeavours ourselves. Therefore, Elpidius, let us in dignified manner go to meet the dawn that lies beyond those clouds. Oh, my friend, if that is the dawn, I'd rather the long cheerless night had endured for ever, for it was quiet and peaceful. Don't you think our time passed tolerably well in instructive converse? And now my soul trembles before the tempest drawing nigh. Say what you will, but there before us are no ordinary shades of the dead night. Zeus hurled a bolt into the bottomless gulf. Stesippus looked up to the peak, and his soul was frozen with horror. Huge sombre figures of the Olympian gods crowded on the mountain in a circle. A last ray shot through the region of clouds and mists, and died away like a faint memory. A storm was approaching now, and the powers of night were once more in the ascendant. Dark figures covered the heavens. In the centre, Stesippus could discern the all-powerful son of Cronos surrounded by a halo. The sombre figures of the older gods encircled him in wrathful excitement. Like flocks of birds winging their way in the twilight, like eddies of dust driven by a hurricane, like autumn leaves lashed by Boreas. Numerous minor gods hovered in long clouds and occupied the spaces. When the clouds gradually lifted from the peak and sent down dismal horror to embrace the earth, Stesippus fell upon his knees. Later he admitted that in this dreadful moment he forgot all his master's deductions and conclusions. His courage failed him, and terror took possession of his soul. He merely listened. Two voices resounded there, where before had only been silence, the one the mighty and threatening voice of the Godhead, the other the weak voice of a mortal, which the wind carried from the mountain slope to the spot where Stesippus had left Socrates. Are you, thus spake the voice from the clouds, are you the blasphemous Socrates, who strives with the gods of heaven and earth? Once there were none so joyous, so immortal as we. Now for long we have passed our days in darkness because of the unbelief and doubt that have come upon earth. Never has the mist closed in on us so heavily as since the time your voice resounded in Athens, the city we once so dearly loved. Why did you not follow the commands of your father, Sophroniscus? The good man permitted himself a few little sins, especially in his youth, yet, by way of recompense, we frequently enjoyed the smell of his offerings. Stay, son of Cronos, and solve my doubts. Do I understand that you prefer cowardly hypocrisy to searchings for the truth? At this question the crags trembled with the shock of a thundering peal, the first breath of the tempest scattered in the distant gorges. But the mountains still trembled, for he who was enthroned upon them still trembled, and in the anxious quiet of the night only distant sighs could be heard. In the very bowels of the earth the chained titans seemed to be groaning under the blow of the son of Cronos. 
Where are you now, you impious questioner? Suddenly came the mocking voice of the Olympian. I am here, son of Cronos, on the same spot. Nothing but your answer can move me from it. I am waiting. Thunder bellowed in the clouds like a wild animal amazed at the daring of a Libyan tamer's fearless approach. At the end of a few moments, the voice again rolled over the spaces. Son of Sophroniscus, is it not enough that you bred so much scepticism on earth that the clouds of your doubt reached even to Olympus? Indeed, many a time when you were carry on your discourse in the marketplaces, or in the academies, or on the promenades, it seemed to me as if you had already destroyed all the altars on earth, and the dust were rising from them up to us here on the mountain. Even that is not enough. Here, before my very face, you will not recognize the power of the immortals. Zeus, thou art wrathful. Tell me, who gave me the demon which spoke to my soul throughout my life, and forced me to seek the truth without resting? Mysterious silence reigned in the clouds. Was it not you? You are silent. Then I will investigate the matter. Either this divine beginning emanates from you or from someone else. If from you, I bring it to you as an offering. I offer you the ripe fruit of my life, the flame of the spark of your own kindling. See, son of Cronos, I preserved my gift. In my deepest heart grew the seed that you sowed. It is the very fire of my soul. It burnt in all those crises when, with my own hand, I tore the thread of life. Why will you not accept it? Would you have me regard you as a poor master whose age prevents him from seeing that his own pupil obediently follows out his commands? Who are you that would command me to stifle the flame that has illumined my whole life, ever since it was penetrated by the first ray of sacred thought? The sun says not to the stars, Be extinguished, that I may rise. The sun rises, and the weak glimmer of the stars is quenched by its far, far stronger light. The day says not to the torch, Be extinguished, you interfere with me. The day breaks, and the torch smokes, but no longer shines. The divinity that I am questing is not you who are afraid of doubt. That divinity is like the day, like the sun, and shines without extinguishing other lights. The God I seek is the God who would say to me, Wanderer, give me your torch, you no longer need it, for I am the source of all light. Searcher for truth, set upon my altar the little gift of your doubt, because in me is its solution. If you are that God, hearken to my questions. No one kills his own child, and my doubts are a branch of the eternal spirit whose name is truth. Round about, the fires of heaven tore the dark clouds, and out of the howling storm again resounded the powerful voice. Whither did your doubts tend, you arrogant sage, who renounce humility, the most beautiful adornment of earthly virtues? You abandoned the friendly shelter of credulous simplicity to wander in the desert of doubt. You have seen this dead space from which the living gods have departed. Will you traverse it, you insignificant worm, who crawl in the dust of your pitiful profanation of the gods? Will you vivify the world? Will you conceive the unknown divinity to whom you do not dare to pray? You miserable digger of dung, soiled by the smut of ruined altars, are you perchance the architect who shall build the new temple? Upon what do you base your hopes, you who disavow the old gods and have no new gods to take their place? The eternal night of doubts unsolved, the dead desert deprived of the living spirit. This is your world, you pitiful worm, who gnawed at the living belief which is a refuge for simple hearts, who converted the world into a dead chaos. Now then, where are you, you insignificant, blasphemous sage? Nothing was heard but the mighty storm roaring through the spaces. Then the thunder died away. The wind folded its pinions, and torrents of rain streamed through the darkness. 
like incessant floods of tears which threatened to devour the earth and drown it in a deluge of unquenchable grief. It seemed to Stesippus that the master was overcome, and that the fearless, restless, questioning voice had been silenced for ever. But a few moments later it issued again from the same spot. Your words, son of Cronus, hit the mark better than your thunderbolts. The thoughts that you have cast into my terrified soul have haunted me often. It has often seemed as if my heart would break under the burden of their unendurable anguish. Yes, I abandoned the friendly shelter of credulous simplicity. Yes, I have seen the spaces from which the living gods have departed, enveloped in the night of eternal doubt. But I walked without fear, for my demon lighted the way, the divine beginning of all life. Let us investigate the question. Are not offerings of incense burnt on your altars in the name of him who gives life? You are stealing what belongs to another. Not you, but that other is served by credulous simplicity. Yes, you are right. I am no architect. I am not the builder of a new temple. Nor to me was it given to raise from the earth to the heavens the glorious structure of the coming faith. I am one who digs dung, soiled by the smut of destruction. But my conscience tells me, son of Cronos, that the work of one who digs dung is also necessary for the future temple. When the time comes for the proud and stately edifice to stand on a purified place, and for the living divinity of the new belief to erect his throne upon it, I, the modest digger of dung, will go to him and say, here am I who restlessly crawled in the dust of disavowal, when surrounded by fog and soot I had no time to raise my eyes from the ground. My head had only a vague conception of the future building. Will you reject me, you just one, just and true and great? Silence and astonishment reigned in the spaces. Then Socrates raised his voice and continued. The sunbeam falls upon the filthy puddle, and light vapour, leaving heavy mud behind, rises to the sun, melts, and dissolves in the ether. With your sunbeam you touch my dust-laden soul, and it inspired to you, unknown one, whose name is Mystery. I sought for you, because you are truth. I strove to attain to you, because you are justice. I loved you because you are love. I died for you because you are the source of life. Will you reject me, O unknown? My torturing doubts, my passionate search for truth, my difficult life, my voluntary death, accept them as a bloodless offering, as a prayer, as a sigh. Absorb them as the immeasurable ether absorbs the evaporating mists. Take them. You whose name I do not know, let not the ghosts of the night I have traversed bar the way to you, to eternal light. Give way, you shades who dim the light of the dawn. I tell you, gods of my people, you are unjust, and where there is no justice there can be no truth, but only phantoms, creations of a dream. To this conclusion have I come, I, Socrates, who sought to fathom all things. Rise, dead mists. I go on my way to him whom I have sought all my life long. The thunder burst again, a short abrupt peal, as if the aegis had fallen from the weakened hand of the thunderer. Stormed voices trembled from the mountains, sounding dully in the gorges, and died away in the clefts. In their place resounded other marvellous tones. When Stesippus looked up in astonishment, a spectacle presented itself such as no mortal eyes had ever seen. The night vanished, the clouds lifted, and godly figures floated in the azure like golden ornaments on the hem of a festive robe. Heroic forms glimmered over the remote crags and ravines, and Elpidius, whose little figure was seen standing at the edge of a cleft in the rock, stretched his hands toward them, as if beseeching the vanishing gods for a solution of his fate. A mountain peak now stood out clearly above the mysterious mist, gleaming like a torch over dark blue valleys. 
the son of Cronos, the Thunderer, was no longer enthroned upon it, and the other Olympians, too, were gone. Socrates stood alone in the light of the sun under the high heavens. Ctesippus was distinctly conscious of the pulse-beat of mysterious life quivering throughout nature, stirring even the tiniest blade of grass. A breath seemed to be stirring the balmy air, a voice to be sounding in wonderful harmony, an invisible tread to be heard, the tread of the radiant dawn. And on the illumined peak a man stood still, stretching out his arms in mute ecstasy, moved by a mighty impulse. A moment, and all disappeared, and the light of an ordinary day shone upon the awakened soul of Ctesippus. It was like dismal twilight after the revelation of nature that had blown upon him the breath of an unknown life. In deep silence the pupils of the philosopher listened to the marvellous recital of Ctesippus. Plato broke the silence. Let us investigate the dream and its significance, he said. Let us investigate it, responded the others. End of the Shades A Fantasy by Vladimir G. Korolenko Part 2 Recording by Algy Pug, Perth, Western Australia